I'm Dr. Craig Eskide, the host of IDD Health Matters, a podcast where we talk about health, wellness, and health equity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Hope you enjoy it. So welcome to this episode of IDD Health Matters. And today we have Grace Gould who's with us today and she has some great experiences in this field and I can't wait to hear more about them. And I'll give you a little insight. Grace and I kind of work together, so uh, we, we know each other pretty well. But Grace, would you take a moment and tell everybody who you are and really how did you get started in this field? Um, sure. So I'm, I'm Grace Gould. Um, I have been a teacher for the last 21 years. Um, out of that 21 years, I, I taught kindergarten for the first four, and then my son uh, was diagnosed with autism. And after going to the doctor, oh. many doctors, um, we weren't getting any answers. And I was looking at medical professionals for answers when his pediatrician said to me, I have MD after my name, but you have MOM before yours, be an advocate. And that, set my entire career path at that moment, uh, that statement. So. That's pretty cool. Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. You have MD after your name, but I have MOM before my name. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was a pivotal moment in my life. I immediately enrolled in school again, um, got my master's degree in special education, um, did many Google searches, many web MDs, which probably isn't the best thing to do. <laughs> um, but when you're learning, you know, you have to go through all of that. Um, had a lot of stumbling blocks along the way during my son's diagnosis, um, and then just found a passion. I, I realized there weren't um, there weren't quality educators in that field. Unfortunately, they were they were burnt out. They were tired. They were undervalued, underpaid, and uh, I also was. Um, <laughs> but it was great to um, to bring a vibrant, I was young, much younger then, a vibrant young, you know, personality um, that was fun to that environment where these kids don't have birthday parties with tons of friends and sleepovers and they can't go on the field trip because they're too medically needy. And um, so it was fun to bring all of that to their lives. So you did something quite amazing. You started what? Uh, so... Thank you. Um, I started um, the Movement School. It's um, a nonprofit organization school in Largo, Florida for students with varying disabilities, um, kindergarten, and then they age out at 23. Um, and the school really focuses, there's a huge, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, a divide between the therapists and the teachers. Um, and the therapists know everything and the teachers know everything. Um, so, and, and what really, we're working towards the same goal. So if we, have, if, if we communicate, we can get there, but if we're working against each other, we're not. And that was the issue. Um, and I don't know how it is nationwide, but in the county that I live in, in Florida, um, students max out at 90 minutes a week with their, all three of their, their therapies, speech, OT, and PT. And I always use the same analogy, but you know, if you were 100 pounds overweight and trying to lose weight and you only worked out 30 minutes a week, you'd never reach that goal. Uh, so for my students, only going for 30 minutes and then you have transition time, you have, um, you know, maybe there's a few behaviors that may, uh, you know, arise and then you're really only getting maybe 10 minutes of that therapy. So we took the, that idea of um, really having six hours of therapy and integrated their therapy into their academics so that the students also had that sense of belonging. They weren't constantly leaving the classroom and going, here's another new person, here's another new person. Oh, that therapist isn't here today, so now you have you know, somebody else. And it was consistency, it, it created a, a safe environment for them to be themselves, to, um, again, get their academics and their therapies all in one place. What a, what a great integration of, of, of two disciplines uh, working together for the common goal. And you saw that as a challenge. And that is a challenge in a lot of areas in, in this field. We know that um, so certain clinicians don't necessarily communicate with other clinicians. And uh, they have different levels of understanding. And that's, that's true throughout all healthcare, not just, not just in this field. And that's why one of the movements that, that, that we're seeing is the movement towards integrated healthcare, integrated medicine, where the disciplines do talk more to each other uh, because we, we work 
better together, I think. And yes. when we when we can build off of each other's skills and having that that kind of uh, team mindset and that team approach and, and what we, we, we call it interdisciplinary, uh, an inter- interdisciplinary approach where people of different uh, disciplines come together to work to provide uh, support services, healthcare, whatever it is, to people who need them in a in a, in a different way. So, you you kind of did that in the education world. That's that's fantastic. That, that that's uh, that's wonderful. So, tell us about what else you're doing besides <laughs> all of that stuff. How long is this podcast? <laughs> um, so, while I was a teacher. Um, I had several, I was written up many times, um, because there would there was some type of situation that would happen, a medical situation, and I was not a nurse, and I would try to remedy the situation the best I could, um, and so I would get in trouble, so I put myself through nursing school. Um, and um, then it was, you know, oh, well, you know, only the therapist can do that, only the you know, behavioral specialist, so I but myself I went to school to become a behavioral therapist uh, specialist. So um, I, 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 I was engulfed in the environment and, and with just making a difference and being an advocate and being a voice. Um, and, you know, I'm also an IP advocate as well. I have, there's a, I have a couple fun things that I've done under my belt, but um, going to nursing school, that's kind of to play off of what you just said, um, I went to nursing school to learn more. And then I go to nursing school and I didn't learn more. Um, and that was a huge, I mean, I was actually- About this field. About this field, yes, about IDD. Um, and that was a huge shock to me. I, I That was the whole purpose of me going to nursing school. Um, and I was a little disappointed, to be honest with you, with it. Um, and kind of, I know I'm jumping all over the place, but. Um, Fast forward to what led me to where I am now um, at Inflectability. I had, as you know, one of my students who was, you know, you all you say they're all your favorite, but or you don't have favorites, <laughs> but she was my favorite. Um, and um, I was very, very close to her. And because of the way our, our school was designed, she was my student for six years in the same environment with me. Um, and we developed a very, like I went on her make-a-wish trip with her. Um, very close to the family. Both of her parents passed away within six months of each other and her and her brother, um, they both have myotonic dystrophy and they were placed in a home and within a week, she contra- and this was during COVID, she contracted COVID, went to the hospital, this is kind of the cliff note version, but, um, and, and you know, made it through COVID. She did great and she went to the step down unit and in the step down unit, she that was fed um, chicken tenders and she aspirated and died. And the backstory of that is that she had never even passed a swallow test in 12 years. And I, they didn't know that it wasn't, I'm not, I'm not placing blame on anyone or anywhere um, except for the lack of tools that, that help. I mean, from everyone from the group home to the, the emergency medical team, to the you know the staff that was at the hospital, if any of them had had any of the tools that intellectuality offers, um, I, I think the outcome would have been different. So that's kind of what led me to my role at intellectuality was I felt like I needed you know a microphone, uh, no pun intended, <laughs> one. I know, um, to to really get that message out there um, of of what's happening, you know, and then and then what what. You know, not to sound like Debbie Downer or make it even more of a sad of a story, but you know, to me that was that was my story and that was close to my heart. And but to find out that it's happening everywhere um, was was devastating. Preventable death, and that's what a lot of what we focus on is preventable causes of death. We can't prevent all death, obviously. Nobody can do that, but there are certainly um, things that can be done, and a lot of it relates to education and understanding um, about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the different ways that um, health conditions present. They, they might have different signs and symptoms. You, you know all of these things. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so you know, when, when we're talking about that type of information, what are, what are one, of the, one or two of the things that you see at in intellectuality that, that you really like? Um, I'm, I'm huge on person-centeredness. Um, I love that, but as far as the the health side goes, um, 
I, I'll be honest, when I took the position, I, you know, I came in kind of like, oh, I know everything. <laughs> um, and wasn't too happy to have to go through the trainings myself. I'm like, oh, great, I'll just sit through these and, you know, full honesty here. Um, but within the first, and with 21 years in the field, um, within the first five minutes, I was pausing it to get my notes to write stuff down um, with the, the fatal five. Um, you know, you, you think you know until you, do, you realize you don't know um, with the fatal five and as well as um, the curriculum in IDD healthcare, I think was really, that was that missing piece of my nursing school that I was looking for. Um, so that's one of, I always, you know, promote that at anywhere, anywhere that I can go. Um. Yeah, and, and you, you write about we don't know what we don't know. I was in that exact same position as, as a physician. You know, I thought, oh, I'm going to go work at this intermediate care facility. It'll be fine. It's just health care. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know this this stuff. And we we don't know as clinicians what we don't know. And when we begin, and, and that, that other part you said, which was great that you admitted that, because I kind of felt the same way, but you, you think, oh, I know all of this. I know all about this. And then, so we, we're overly confident in the beginning because we think we know all of these things and then we start to learn more and we're like, ooh, I got more to learn about this. Yes. And then we start to learn a lot more and then we become truly competent. And that, this is, that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's really kind of kind of a neat a neat thing. So look it up out there. <laughs> um, and uh, but but yeah. So you I mean, you really have come to this this field with a lot of energy. Uh, it sure took a lot of energy to do all these things that you do and all the degrees you have and the certifications and all that. Man, how, how impressive is that? Um, but, but because of that, you have a lot of passion for what you do, which yeah. makes you do a great job. So yes. I'm really, really glad we work together. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. so, you know, um, there, are, there are challenges uh, to health equity, to people receiving health care, uh, equitable health care. And we touched on on education. Are there some other things that you that that you find you have found challenging when accessing the healthcare system that you can, might want to talk about? Um, so, being that I've never worked in a in a clinical environment, um, I the things that I've noticed as an outsider, um, and even with you know um, some providers that were treating some of my students, um, it's almost like the way they would talk to them or treat them is not the way they would talk or treat me. And why is that any different? Um, you know, I would take some of my students to their doctor's appointments um, or a ther therapy session, and the physician or someone would directly speak to me and not to them. Um, so those, those again, I don't have really clinical experience to be able to speak upon, but that that's very valuable insight. And we hear we hear those things a lot. We know those things a lot. And um, so yeah, it's great that you brought that up, though. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, there, there's something that, that I, I like to challenge people with, and I call it three and three. So you've got three minutes oh. to, uh, so there's your limit, Grace. All right, All right can you talk chatty, about sorry. All right, so, we, but you know what? I'm not really gonna keep time, so. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, but, but you've got about three minutes to tell listeners, viewers, things that they can do to work towards improving health, wellness, um, community integration, support network, support systems, anything you want to touch on, anything that you would really like to tell people about this field or things that they can do to just improve the world of, of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Okay, volunteer. Volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Get involved in organizations. They're nationwide. I sit on several different boards <laughs> um, for a lot of different organizations because they're, I mean, I'm blessed to be able to do that. Um, I think that another thing is to, you know, if you're um, a parent, you know, to expose your children to other children in the IDD community from a young age so it's not um, foreign to them. Um, that was a big, that's a big thing for me that I'm, I'm, I have three children of my own and I'm so thankful that my, my kids now are adults and they're advocates themselves in, in certain ways. So I think um, exposure, I think, um, Another thing too is, um, you know, education. <laughs> I mean, obviously I, I, I enjoy learning, um, but I, I think that, um, you know, Google search, 
Google search. If you don't know, do, I mean, there's, I had no idea that there was, there were companies like Intellectability. I had no idea. I had no idea that there were organizations out there with tools to make a difference. Um, and I mean, it's, you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and there's, there's organizations, there's, um, you know, physicians, there's, there's people within the IDD community with knowledge and skill sets um, and tools that can help anyone learn. Um, so seek that out. Great advice. I, I tell you, it, it's really an impressive story that, that you have. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. And I look forward to uh, hearing updates on, on things down the road. So we'll probably do this again. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, thank, thank you so much for being a part of this today and You're for welcome. the work that you do every day. All right. Thank you.